All right, well, let's grab a seat and get started. Let me open this up in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for another opportunity just to gather and, and to worship you and to think about you and fellowship and, and to think about your word and, and to let your word shape our lives. Uh, what a wonderful day in the, in, the, um, in the Christian faith, Lord, when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. We think about the gospel witnesses where Christ has died for our sin and been raised from the dead. We think about the impact that that resurrection had on the disciples. Uh, Father, they truly witnessed something um, uh, um, incredible. Uh, they devoted their life to him and ultimately gave their life for him as well. And so, Father, we pray this morning as we open up your word that your word will search our heart, you know, apply the truths uh, through your spirit to our lives. And, Father, may we be more passionate disciples for you. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going to take a look this morning at Matthew chapter 16. You can go ahead and turn there uh, in, your, in your Bibles, uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16. And we'll be there in just a few moments. But one of the most uh, well-known and beloved stories in the Bible is the Old Testament story of the Exodus. I mean, movies have been made about it. There's been animated series about it. Um, I remember watching... Um, the, the Ten Commandments as a kid uh, with Charlton, was it Charlton Heston? I think that's who it is. And I remember several times watching that as a kid. And I just, I loved it. I loved that scene where the Red Sea parts and everybody crosses over. Um, I just thought that was incredible as a kid. But it, the Exodus is one of the most beloved stories in the Bible. And our Easter celebration has ties to the Exodus because the entire event foreshadows the person and the work of Christ. Now, the Exodus stories, you know, has a supernatural beginning. Uh, we, when you open up the book of Exodus, you'll find that God is speaking, Yahweh is speaking to Moses through a burning bush, and he tells Moses of his plans to liberate his people from their Egyptian slavery. But most importantly for Moses, God tells him that he is the man who is going to do it. And of course, you know the story, Moses uh, uh, um, uh, protests. He, he doesn't think that he's qualified to do it, and he finally gives in and accepts uh, the God's calling on his life. And then Moses leads the Israelites out of their Egyptian slavery. And then 40 years later, um, God's people are now on the doorstep of entering the promised land. And uh, right before Moses dies, he delivers one final message to God's people. That message is the book of Deuteronomy, the entire book. So just imagine if you've ever tried to read Deuteronomy, imagine listening to Moses give that uh, message right before he dies. And you know Moses sinned. He wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. But this was his final word to God's people. And in the book of Deuteronomy, several places throughout that book, he reminds God's people of an important principle. He said, once you arrive in the promised land, once you settle down in the land of, of milk and honey, as it's called, he said, don't forget your God. All throughout the book, he said in chapter 4, Pay careful attention, lest you forget the things, listen to this, that you have seen and disregard them for the rest of your life. In other words, he said, don't forget what you saw in the Exodus. Don't forget the, the pouring out of the plagues. Don't forget the crossing of, of the Red Sea. And he said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. He goes on in chapter 6. He says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, that place of slavery. You must revere the Lord your God and serve him. You must not go after other gods, the gods of the people around you. And then he goes on in chapter 8. Again, be careful that you do not forget your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and you're satisfied, when you build your fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and your flocks grow large, your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. It's very telling that Moses has to say so many times, don't forget your God. Don't forget him. And it's also very telling that he has to remind them, you should love the Lord your God, especially after what he has done for you. 
The forgetfulness that Moses speaks about here is, is not a lapse in memory as in forgetting an appointment or forgetting a meeting. The Hebrew word that he uses there means to neglect something. And so he means to, uh, not to neglect God. It's a disregarding of God in our daily life, which starts by neglecting his word. And when it comes to neglecting God, it's always an internal problem. It's an internal problem that manifests itself externally. And so it starts with, with a heart issue. And here uh, Moses reminds them that it's a choice that they make, and these small choices over time will add up to a life that has forgotten God, that is disregarding God by disregarding his word for their life. Ultimately, it's a failure to cultivate our heart, to sow what is beneficial to spiritual growth, removing and guarding against the things that hinder that growth and our closeness to Christ, which is why the child of God has to guard their heart. Uh, it's why Paul said in, in Romans chapter 12 to renew your mind, to renovate your way of thinking, putting God's word into your mind, letting it shape our mind so that it renovates how we, how we think about life around us. It's the reason why Paul said in Philippians 4 eight to think on things that are true and just, commendable and excellent, and praiseworthy because what goes on internally always affects us externally what we put in our life always comes out through our words comes out through our actions and through our emotions and it always charts the general course of our life and so the bible puts a heavy premium a high price on the mind uh, and putting god's word into our heart if you remember jesus said in the gospel of, of matthew chapter 15 he says, it's not what goes in your mouth that defiles the person, it's what comes out. He says, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, adultery, immorality, false testimony, and slander. And so the heart is something to take care of because once the heart begins to lose its, its, its vision of God, it then charts a course for disregarding God. And so God's Old Testament people, one of the ways that they guarded against this was a series of feasts and festivals that would remind them every single year of the great things that God had done for them. It was always to keep God before their vision, keep God before their eyes, so that their heart was passionate for him, it was soft toward him in their daily lives. And so these, these feasts, these festivals, they were designed to preserve the knowledge of God and his work on their behalf. And, and memorials really worked that way. If you look at uh, veterans' memorials or any other kind of memorials, they're always there to remind us of, of the people who have gone before and the events that have shaped our life and the sacrifices that people have made. And those memorials are designed not only to remember those, but also to affect us as well in how we live, live our daily lives. Um, there was a time in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua where God's people were on the banks of the Jordan River and in order to cross the river, it required a miracle, and God parted the Jordan River, dried it up, allowed them to walk across dry land, and they were specifically told that as they crossed, they were to take a stone from the middle of the Jordan and build a memorial of 12 stones on the banks. And the reason they were to do that was so that when their kids see it, they were to be able to tell their kids, this is what God has done on our behalf. This is what your God did for his people. The church is not without its memorials as well. Uh, we have believers' baptism, for example, that reminds us of the change that has taken place. But we also have a memorial that you see here this morning. It's called the Lord's Table. Now, churches call it different things, communion, the Eucharist, whatever it may be. Uh, but the Lord's Table is designed to be a memorial. Jesus instituted it the night before he was crucified. And he said, whenever you observe this, you always do it in remembrance of me. It's a reminder of what's been accomplished on our behalf. The table is designed to preserve in our memory uh, what Christ has done for us. It's designed to preserve in our memory uh, the motivating uh, uh, love that, that moved God to, to send Jesus into the world. But it's also designed uh, to remind us of the implications for our life. The cross is more than just simply Jesus dying for our sins. The cross is more than just simply Jesus reconciling us to God. The cross is also something now that Christians take up in their daily life. There's more to the cross than, 
than, than just simply a, a place where Christ has paid the penalty for our sin. And so the Easter season, of course, helps us with this. It reminds us of what God has done for us, what was motivating him to do it, but also its implication for our lives. Now, you know, Easter is not a, it's not a, 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 a what would you call it, a biblical holiday. Christmas is not a biblical holiday. These are things that have come along down through the ages, but they're great holidays because of what they remind us of. Christmas time, we stop and we reflect on the fact that God has sent a Savior into the world. And then Easter time is when we stop and we reflect on the fact that that Savior has come into the world to die for our sins and he has been raised from the dead. And because of this, it helps us to refocus our attention on the cross and its reason for it and its impact on our daily lives. There's something else about memorials as well. They often mark turning points in the life of people, turning points in history, turning points in the life of individual people. Uh, two examples of this from the Bible, of course, one of them I just mentioned was the 12 stones of the Jordan River. This was a turning point in the life of God's Old Testament people because God had promised them that he had a land for them. It was called the Promised Land. And, and it marked a turning point in their relationship and in their life together because now they were stepping foot into the promised land. God was fulfilling his promises to them. The Passover as well. It's another memorial um, that, is, uh, that was instituted. If you remember the Passover uh, from, the <clears throat> from the Old Testament, it commemorates the liberation or the emancipation of the Israelites from their Egyptian slavery. They had served as slaves for so many years, and God had promised them that one day he would set them free. And uh, he sent Moses to, to let them go, and Moses stood before Pharaoh, and he delivered God's message to him. Uh, but, of course, the Pharaoh refused to obey. I love that statement he makes in, in Exodus chapter 5. Who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice? Just a great statement, right? A great statement that was setting him up to be humble. And, and God released, uh, uh, because of that, God released upon Egypt a, a series of destructive plagues. And uh, it afflict, uh, afflicted not only the Egyptian people, but also their life as well, destroying their crops, having a tremendous impact upon their land. But the worst one of all was the final plague, when God sent his angel throughout the land of Egypt, and he took the life of the firstborn of the Egyptians, and even the firstborn of all the livestock. And, of course, that was the turning point. Uh, God had told his people that they were to kill a, a, a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost of their homes. And if they did so, the angel would pass over their homes. That's where the name Passover comes from. And the reason why the angel would pass over their homes is because someone else has already died for them. You see, even God's people had their own sin as well. And, and in order to be, to be spared of what God was doing to the Egyptians, Someone had to die in their place. And so it was a foreshadowing of the event of Christ. And when they killed the lamb, they put the blood on the doorpost. It was a sign that they not only had obeyed God, but someone else had paid their penalty for them. And so the angel passed over. God's people were released. And they left, of course, the land of Egypt. And now they were becoming God's special people. And it became a turning point in the history of God's people. Uh, it marked a new chapter in their relationship with God. And as we have gathered, you know, for worship today, the Easter holiday also marks the same, along with the Lord's table here. Both of them are memorials of turning points in our life, memorials of what God has done for us in the person of, of Jesus Christ, but it also marks a turning point in the life of the child of God. Now, all of you know that at Easter time, this is a time that we place special emphasis on the death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Uh, when you think about Romans 3.23, I mean, we all know that verse, I would imagine. Um, for all people have sinned against God and they have fallen short of his glory. And what that means is, is that all people throughout the ages have fallen short of properly honoring God as he should be honored. And so the cross then becomes a turning point in human history. Now, a turning point is de defined as a point in time at which a now listen to this a significant change occurs, especially one with beneficial results. That is the cross. It's a point in time in history 
when a significant change occurred in human history and it created beneficial results for anyone who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the blessings of the cross are priceless. They become the personal ownership of the sinner at the moment that they place their faith in Christ. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, everyone who believes has eternal life. He, he said the moment that, that, that we believe he is the Christ, the Son of God, at that very moment, we are born again. At that very moment, we receive the gift of eternal life. We also become a child of God. Our sins against God have been forgiven. Um, Romans chapter uh, 4 makes this very clear that our sins have been forgiven. And then also you see in this passage here behind me, Romans chapter 5, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The moment that anyone believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, at that very moment they are put in a right relationship with God. And if you were here for the Galatians series, that was the very thing that upset Paul so much in Galatia because these false teachers had come in and they were telling people, your faith in Jesus is not enough. Now you've got to add certain works to your life in order to become a member of God's people. And Paul said that is not the saving message. The saving message is much simpler than that. It's the moment someone believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, it's at that moment they become a member of God's people. And so the cross has been a tremendous blessing to our life. But there's more to the cross, as I just said earlier, more to the cross than simply Jesus dying for our sins, more than the fact that we've been reconciled to God. The cross now becomes a turning point in our relationship with Christ, but it also becomes a turning point in the overall outlook of our life, of how we think about our life and how we think about what we live for, how we use our earthly life. One of the words that's used in the Bible is stewardship. And when we hear the word stewardship, we often think of money, right? I mean, that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. But when the Bible uses stewardship of a Christian, it's talking about how that man or woman is using their Christian life. What did they do with their time on earth once they came to faith in Christ? How did they steward their earthly lives? Second uh, Corinthians 5.15, you can see it here behind me. Paul said that Jesus died for all so that those... Uh, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised. Uh, Paul uh, is reminding us of one of the most powerful implications of the cross. Uh, the cross does more than just reconcile us to God. It now changes the overall outlook of our life and what we do with it. And so it marks a turning point in the overall life of the child of God. Now, one place that we see that this morning is in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16. Um, I, I hope that you have read through the Gospel of Matthew. You probably are familiar with this chapter. Uh, but in this chapter, it marks a turning point in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Up to this point, he had been going throughout Israel teaching about the kingdom of God. If you remember, that was his message. He was preparing people for the fact that the kingdom of God has arrived in him. He is their king. But there was also coming a day when Christ would return back to establish that kingdom on earth. And so he's getting people ready for that. He's teaching about the kingdom uh, in Matthew. And now at this point in his life, something has changed in his ministry. Now he is focused on one place and one place only. He is on his way to Jerusalem because this is the reason that, he's came, the reason that he came, was to die for the sins of the world. And so Matthew chapter 16 marks a turning point in that ministry. If you remember, the beginning of the chapter is, is famous for Peter's confession, uh, called the Great Confession, actually. Jesus asked Peter, uh, you know, who do people say that I am? And, and, and they said, well, you know, some people say you're this prophet, you're that prophet, you're this person, you're that person. And then he asked Peter, but who do you say that I am? And Peter made the confession that the church is built upon. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the saving message right there. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Anyone who believes that that statement is true about Jesus, it's at that moment that they become a child of God. And Jesus told Peter, he said, upon this rock I will build my church. That is the foundation of the church. It's the saving message of Christ. And then after this, Jesus begins to start talking about his suffering, his death, 
and his resurrection. So now there's a change in his ministry. No more is he going throughout Israel teaching. Uh, no more is he teaching about the kingdom of God. Now he's focused on one event and one event only. He's going to Jerusalem to die for the sin of the world. And so here we see this turning point in our lives, in the life of, of human history. But not only that, Jesus then applies the cross to the lives of other people, to the lives of his people. And now we see a turning point in the life of the child of God. And so we can see that. Look at verse 21, starting off. He says, uh, and you can see it here behind me, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the experts in the law, and be killed and on the third day be raised. So he did this three times. It's recorded a total of nine times throughout the gospel, but three times he tells his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem, the Son of Man. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And then I'm going to be raised from the dead. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, I, I talked about the necessity of the resurrection. And if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then that means Jesus himself is a liar. Because he clearly said here, I'm going to die and I'm going to be raised from the dead. Three times in this gospel, three times in Mark, three times in Luke, it's recorded that Christ clearly told them that he is going to die for the sins of the world. And so now we have a turning point in the ministry of Christ, something new. And here he is preparing his disciples for what's about to come. And one of the reasons that he's doing this is because in their mind, they, they had a good understanding of the Messiah. The Messiah one day would be a political ruler who would rule over uh, uh, the world in a, in a kingdom that lasts forever. But what they didn't know is that before there could be a crown, there had to be a cross. And here Jesus is now preparing them that the Messiah actually has to die on a cross he has to suffer, and he's going to be raised from the dead. And so Peter didn't respond very well to it. If you look at verse 22 here behind me, he said, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And he said, God forbid, Lord, this must not happen to you. Peter was unable to reconcile a death on a cross with what he knew about the Messiah from the Old Testament. Um, what happened here is that Jesus has uncovered a misunderstanding in Peter, and I would imagine there would have been a misunderstanding in all of the disciples. And then, and then Jesus responds. Look at verse 23. Look at how he responds to it. He's getting down to the problem here. And what has happened is God's word has exposed Peter, and it's uncovered a serious problem. So he says here, he says, uh, uh, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me because you're not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's interest. That's a pretty strong language, right? Uh, to tell somebody, get behind me, Satan. You, you have your mind set on man's interest and not God's interest. You see, at this moment, Peter's interest was set on a political kingdom that was one day coming. He couldn't reconcile a Messiah being humiliated on a cross uh, what he could see was what the Old Testament clearly taught, that one day a Messiah is coming, he is going to set up a worldwide kingdom, and that kingdom is going to last forever. Well, what Peter didn't realize is that the Messiah has to die first. And so uh, he, he tells Jesus, he said, you know, God forbid that this happens. Christ responds, uh, look, get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block to me. And what happened at that very moment is Peter is actually becoming a stumbling block to the devotion of Christ to the Father's plan of redemption. He, he, he's now getting in the way of what Jesus came to do. Um, God's interests are summarized in devotion to God's will. Satan's interests, of course, are summarized as disobedience. And what Peter unknowingly is doing at this moment, he is simply becoming Satan's man. He is standing between Jesus and his devotion to the Father's will which, which entails going to the cross and dying for the sins of the world. Peter truly believes that Jesus is the Messiah. It's, it's not as if Peter is unconverted at this point. Uh, he has placed his faith in Christ, but now his understanding is being opened up to all that the Messiah entails. Now look what happens in verse 24. Jesus then applies this uh, to his uh, disciples. He said, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, 
and follow me. Notice Christ didn't say, if anyone wants to believe in me, they have to take up their cross and follow me. Because believing in Jesus is not defined by what you do. It's defined, it's defined by what you are persuaded and convinced is true. Believing in Jesus means that you believe he is who he said he is, that he is the Christ and the Messiah. And once we place our faith in Christ as, his, as a, a, a sinner and we receive that forgiveness and we become a child of God, the next step in that relationship with Jesus is now to follow him and to follow his teaching. And Christ is making it very clear here at this point, the cross is more than just simply having our sins forgiven. The cross is more than just simply something that concerns Jesus. The cross now concerns disciples. And he said, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your own cross and follow me. Now, Christ is not telling us that if you want to follow me, you need to find somewhere and be crucified. Now, the cross represents, uh, first of all, it represents rejection. Right? When, when Jesus went into Jerusalem, uh, if you were here uh, last week, we talked about the coronation of Jesus as the king. Uh, but his coronation was a coronation of rejection, not of acceptance. And uh, the cross is an instrument of rejection. It is a clear message that Christ was rejected by his people. He says that we have to deny ourselves, and what this means is that we wish to follow Jesus. We have to renounce ourselves as the primary object of our concern and our attention. Uh, Christ came into the world, if you, if you were here for uh, when we were going through the second chapter of Philippians, if you remember Christ laid aside his glory, he took on the form of a slave, and he humbled himself even to the point of the cross, dying on the cross for our sins. And, of course, this is really a heart issue. Taking up the cross is more than just external action. It starts with the heart. It's a decision that values Jesus and puts him first place in our life. And it's true, anyone can externally look like a Christian. We can externally look like a, a disciple. You know, we can, we can do all the outward actions and take up the cross. But if it's not a heart issue, eventually we'll fall away. Taking up the cross begins with a decision in the heart. It starts with a renovation of our way of thinking, and this happens by consuming and digesting the teachings of Christ. So he says we have to deny ourselves. He says we take up our cross. A cross re involves rejection. It revolves or involves suffering. Uh, to some point, now, there are many Christians in this world that suffer far more than we do. Um, but there's going to be some amount of rejection in the life of a believer, even here in this country, if you put Jesus' teachings to practice. There's going to be a certain measure of shame. And thirdly, he says we have to take up the cross to follow him. That means we pattern our lives after his teachings. And so when we put these into perspective, when we put this uh, in, in light of the cross, we then see what the cross here is more than just simply dying for our sins. It's something that we take up in following him. Look in verses 25 through 27. He gives us the reason for a cross-bearing life. He says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What does it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his life? And what can a person give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man came, for the Son of Man will come and with his angels in glory of his Father, and he will reward each person according to what he has done. In other words, he says, listen, if the believer, the person who's put their faith in me and they've been forgiven of their sins, and if they want to preserve their life for their own interest, they're actually going to lose it. They're going to lose any eternal value for their life. And he says, the person who gains the whole world but forfeits his life, what good does it do? And what he's ultimately talking about here is in that last verse, he's reminding God's people there is a day coming when the Messiah is coming back, and he's going to establish a kingdom on earth. And there's a day that every Christian stands before that Messiah, and they give an account of their Christian life. And what he wants his people to do is to think about how they're going to use their Christian life with the time that they have on earth. He says whatever shame we face because we believe in Jesus, whatever rejection we face, whatever we lose in this life, what does he say? 
I will come back and my reward will be with me. I will reward each person according to what he has done. There was a, a scene in the Gospels where Peter says, you know, we've left everything to follow you. And uh, Jesus reminds him that, you know, that those people who have let go of things in their life, those people who have sacrificed in their life, will be rewarded far more in the life to come. And, and this just isn't a, 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 what Jesus is not saying here, he's not like putting the, the carrot in front of the donkey, right? And, and trying to, to uh, entice people to do what he wants them to do. Because ultimately rewards or, or whatever glory that we receive comes because we have treasured Jesus in our life. We have made him first place in our life. He has become the passion of our life and what we do, and we put his teachings in place. And he tells us if we lose our earthly life this way, in other words, we're giving things up, we're making sacrifices, we're changing uh, our life so that we can have more of him, he said that we'll actually find it. Our life will not have been wasted from God's perspective. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that God will not forget the work that we've done for him. You know, we've all have done certain things and we've done good works for other people and people forget what they what you do for them. Have you ever had that happen in your life? You know, something happens, you're like, did that person remember what I did for them back then? Did they remember what we did for them? Well, Paul reminds everyone in 1 Corinthians 15, every Christian, that God will not forget the sacrifices and the things that you have done for him. It'll be remembered on that final day. And so Jesus wraps up this chapter here in this teaching. And he not only tells the people, tells his disciples, look, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be raised from the dead. But he reminds them the cross is also for you. It's also for my disciples. Because it's something that we now take up and follow him. You know, today is a day of remembrance for us. Uh, in just a few moments, we're going to observe communion on the Lord's table. And uh, what's going to happen when I, when I close the message is that'll be a time for you to come up and to take the elements here, the bread and the cup, and then to return to your seat and to take a few moments to think about what this table represents. There will be a song, and then at the end of the song, I'll come back up and we'll take the elements together. Uh, but today is a day of remembrance. It's a day of celebration. Christ has been raised from the dead. Now, I got a text early this morning from another pastor uh, that uh, he sends out texts to different pastors. And he says, Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. It is a wonderful celebration. Jesus has been raised from the dead. That vindicates every single thing that he taught. And it reminds us that he truly is coming back one day. But this table also reminds us of the implications of that of that resurrection for our life and what the cross means for our life. It's a table of remembrance. And it's also a day of self-examination because this is the day that we look to the cross and then we self-examine, go through a period of self-examine to ask ourselves, how have we responded to the cross in our daily life? Now, I, <clears throat> I assume that all of you have already responded in faith to Jesus, that you're already born again, you have uh, God's spirit living within you, but the cross is more than that. It now calls us to examine our life and to ask us about the implications that the cross is now having for daily living. Are we taking it up and following Jesus out of gratitude and passion for what he has accomplished for us? Jesus said that there's going to be rejection if we do, but he said it'll be well worth it in the end because he's going to reward each of us for what we have done in this life. Well, let me close in prayer, and at, at the end of the prayer, this will be a time for you to come forward and take the elements. And uh, while the song is playing, um, I would encourage you just to reflect on what Christ has done for you. Take a time of self-reflection of, of your life and ask, ask yourself, how have I responded to the cross? Have I responded more than just simply believing in Jesus and being born again? Am I now a fully dedicated disciple? We're not going to be perfect at following Jesus in our life, but there's always a place for self-examination of how we responded to that cross and to his teachings as well. Father, we want to thank you for uh, just our time together and reflecting on your word and looking at what Jesus has said. 
Uh, Lord, we think about the fact that this table is a, a memorial that, that reminds us of, of the good things that Christ has accomplished for us. It reminds us of how much you love us and that our sins have truly been forgiven. Lord, it's an incredible thing to think that our sins were placed on Jesus and that you treated Jesus as if he is the one that committed our sin. You poured out your wrath on him at the cross and he died in our place so that now we can be reconciled to you by faith in Jesus. Lord, I pray that we never lose sight of that. We never lose sight of the fact that that free gift of eternal life is ours forever. But I also pray, Lord, that we examine our lives each and every week and think very carefully about what the cross means to our daily lives and how we're following Christ as his disciples. Lord, thank you again for the blessings of the cross. Thank you for uh, the reconciliation. Thank you for pursuing us uh, in our life, sending people in our life to share the gospel so that we could have eternal life. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. While we start the song, go ahead and come up and, and then return to your seat with your elements and, and, uh, and Mark will come back. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. Grace, 
On the night before he was crucified, Jesus spent some final moments with his disciples. And uh, they observed the Passover, the Old Testament Passover that night. But he also instituted what's called the Lord's Table. And that night he gave some final teachings to his disciples, where they weren't truly final teachings because he taught them again once he was raised from the dead. Um, But in that moment, uh, as he spoke with his disciples and told them about what was going to happen and what he was about to do on their behalf and really on behalf of the world as well, that he was dying for the sins of the world. And each time that we observe communion, uh, Jesus said to do it in remembrance of him. And each time we're looking back and thinking about what he did for us, but also what motivated that. The fact that he loved the world. God the Father loved the world. You know, the Bible makes it clear that our sins have created hostility uh, between us and God. It has inflamed his anger and his wrath. But it's amazing to think anger and wrath has been mixed with love. God loves the world. He loves sinners, and he pursues them through the gospel. And you think about your own life, the people who shared the gospel, and who knows how many times they shared the gospel. Each time, God was pursuing you to make you a child of his family. And so as we gather each time, we think about this table, and it's a memorial uh, to the goodness of God and what he's done for us. But at the same time, we're also remembering what the cross means for our daily life. Oftentimes, the word, uh, the figure of eating food in the Bible Uh, was used in the sense of accepting someone's teachings. And so when we come to the table and as as God's people and we take the communion bread and the cup, uh, we are reminded not only of what he's done for us, but also what we are accepting as his disciples, that we're taking on that life of the cross. Now, there's nothing magical about this table. It's a memorial, and it's for God's people, those who have placed their faith in him. It doesn't make you a Christian but it's something that we do as a believer uh, each, each and every time that we observe it. And so that night, Jesus took the bread and he broke it, symbolic of his body being broken on the cross for us. And he said, whenever you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. A covenant is an agreement that is made between two parties. And the new covenant, this agreement that God has made with the sinful world, is this. If you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you will become a child of God. Your sins will be forgiven. Uh, The cup is a reminder that Jesus' blood has been given for us and has cleansed us of all unrighteousness. Your sins against God have been forgiven, but also your future sins, whenever you fall short of what God has commanded, will be forgiven as well. That forgiveness will last for eternity. And so he said, whenever we drink this cup, we do this in remembrance of what he has done for us. And also, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you for this table. It is a reminder of your great love for us. Lord, as we reflect on that day, that Friday when Christ was crucified for our sins, Lord, we thank you that you rejected your son at that cross. Because because of his rejection, we are now accepted by faith in him. We think about the fact that uh, you have taken our sins, the very things that we did, and, and you put them on Jesus and and you treated your own son as if he is the one that committed those sins. We were reminded the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus became sin for us. Lord, we think about the great love that must have motivated Jesus to, to take on all the sinful actions of the world as his own. And then he put himself under your wrath and humility. And Father, he died on that cross for something that we did. And he's been raised from the dead, and we know that means that you have accepted his sacrifice. And so, Father, today we, we, uh, we think about the fact that we are now members of your people. We have been declared righteous by faith in him. And so, Lord, I pray we don't lose sight of that, and that at the same time we're reminded that the cross is there for us to take up and to follow Jesus. 
So, Lord, again, thank you for all that you've done in our lives. Thank you for this Easter season and what it means for us as Christians. And I pray that we not lose sight of the cross in our daily lives as followers of Jesus. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. As celebration for Easter,